Hello, this is the chat, and I am Manny. Welcome. It's the first of its kind. We're bringing in faces you've not seen in a while on television and perhaps be wondering where are they now. I tell you what, I'm excited having my guest on the program this week. Who is he? Wait for it in a moment. Dakbo Olumide was born in February 1959 to one of Nigeria's first generation of broadcasters and a British mother. As a child, he developed a special interest in planes and continuously nursed his curiosity till adulthood. Though based in New York in the late 60s, his parents eventually returned to Nigeria where he attended Corona Primary School, Victoria Islands, Lagos. He later attended the renowned St. Gregory's College, a Catholic mission school in 1971 where he became a founding member of the famous schoolboys band called Ofegi between 1972 and 1975. You try and love, you try and love, with your eyes killed. You try and love, please try and love me, with all your eyes. He left the band to go to the UK to study for his A-levels. The band had a short but successful period under the guidance of legendary producer Odion E. Roje. Dakbo attended the prestigious Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Florida, where he earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautical and computer science. Upon his return to Nigeria in 1982, he began working for Aero Contractors Airline and ascended through the management ranks to the position of managing director, making tremendous contribution to the expansion and modernization of the airline. Captain Dakbo retired from aviation in 2006 to take up a career in banking, becoming the executive director at the Africa Finance Corporation, leading the vision in the areas of infrastructure, project development, and financial management of multinational organization. In November 2008, Captain Dakbo's expertise in the aviation industry was once again called upon to take charge of the struggling Virgin Nigeria Airways to successfully turn it around and prepare it for sale. In 2010, he formed a transport infrastructure company called Ropeways Transport Limited to build an urban cable car system in Lagos. Dakbo has climbed the ladder of success steadily due to his strong leadership qualities and drive. He is happily married with two grown-up children. Welcome to the program. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I'm so keen to know and unravel all that story about Ofegi, okay. the band itself. Well, you see... You, you, you were a member as a, a bass guitarist? You know, or key, what? On the keyboards. You were on the keyboards, mm. okay. Now, where I actually started was there was Meme, Ike Meme, where, where is he now? He's in England. He okay. was a drummer. Yeah. But before he was there as a drummer, then you had Paul Alade, who was a bass guitarist, yeah. Oh, yeah. and then myself. Now, cast yourself back to the beginning. There was a senior band, you know, at school concerts and so on. And we had the senior band, and we just listened to them and thought, well, you know, we can do this. And I was actually formally trained in music. I was the only one who was formally trained. Shagun Buckner, for those who remember that genre, I, he was my piano teacher. And I went up to grade 11. So I could read and write piano music. Um, so I had an appreciation of music. And also coming from a musical background, my father was an opera singer in his part-time. He was a part-time opera singer in University of Ibadan in the days of Glover Hall. We don't have Glover Hall anymore, but we had those places where music was encouraged. Nowadays we have what they call Shell Museum Center and so on, but in those days we had um, Glover Hall and so on. Now, we wanted, we saw, we saw the senior band playing and we thought, well, we could do this, why not? So we got together and started chatting about music, but we were too young. In Form 2, you're only 12 years old. 12. You're 12 years old. The guitar itself is bigger than you. So we'd have to sit down and play the guitar, but we had to borrow people's guitars. And in those days, there was an electric guitar. 
but they wouldn't give you access to the amp amplifier. <laughs> so you'd have to play the guitar and listen to it from the stroking of the keys. Yes. Uh, that was it. You couldn't do anything else. I had the organ because I could play the organ because I had a piano at home. So that's where it started. But what people don't realize is that we were 12 years old when we started. If you look at a 12-year-old child today in Nigeria, you ask yourself, can you do what those guys did? Well, you could only be compared to the Jacksons, as you know, it would seem. But the Jacksons, you see, they had the advantage of being groomed. They had managers. They had the entire... So, 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 so tell me, whose idea was you know, the name of Ofege and the band Ofege? Whose idea was it? The, I'd, say the actual, I'd say the idea for Ofege. Ofege was something we used in Sangre. For those of us in the boarding house, yeah. Ofege was jumping, jumping over the wall. Jumping over the yes, wall, that's yeah. that's jumping over the wall to go out and buy akara yeah. and bread yeah. or whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. That was called Ofege. So that's where the name came from. Mm -hmm. But the name was actually um, acquired, should I say, and uh, brought into the band by Melvin. I'd, Melvin, say. Okay, I'd say the real drivers of the Ofege band. Was that the leader? Was he the leader of the he band? Was the, we didn't actually have a leader because we had a lead vocalist who was Melvin. But the drummer, uh, Meme, was a composer as well. He would compose some songs. And then we had Paul Alade, the bass guitarist. He also composed some songs. Where is Paul Alade? Paul is in the US. Okay. I, I, I think he's in New Jersey. He's in the US. And then some of the songs, for example, Wizzy Labo. Wizzy Labo. Wizzy was the name of my dog, you know, I mean, we lived on Club Road in Ikoi, and our pet dog was called Wizzy. So that's where the song went, and Wizzy Labo smiles, you know that something's wrong yeah. when he dances. So all of that was because of the dog. It was actually a very ill-trained mongrel dog. It had no training whatsoever. So whenever a visitor would come in, he would just attack the visitor. Mm -hmm. So that's where the name Wizzy came from. Labo, Wizzy Labo, Labo was the name of a boy in school. He had, he had polio in his leg, but he was, his name was Ilabo, okay, but we said Wizzy Labo. So you see, we were only 12 years old, 13 years old, so we're not going to be absolutely creative and come up with correct names and lyrics and so on, because we were just young. Um, so that's where it started, and we kept on going, and we had great support from um, our principal in those days, and Adina Ogusa, who was the Commissioner of Education at the time, he was really, really a staunch supporter of us. And we went on tours, we went on concerts. So how did you, how did you come you know, across uh, Odeon Radio? He eventually produced yeah. the... Yeah, you see, Odeon was, you know, in those days we had what we call EMI. You don't have EMI. Now look, I have to put things in perspective. Because anybody listening to this show will say, yeah, but you know, all these, uh, I don't know what they call these musicians today, you know, but they're all electronic. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't involve talent, but the talent they must have is to dance, okay? Because not so much playing an instrument, that doesn't actually qualify for anything these days. It's dancing and the half-naked girls and so on and so forth. But in, in our days, in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, music was not something that your parents would encourage for you to go into music because it didn't have a future, okay? Unless you were extreme, like Fela, for example, uh, and Blow and all those. But they were all fringe things, which there wasn't a global response. So when we came along, we didn't actually have a genre. Although if you go onto iTunes, they say it's funkadelic, no, actually, iTunes calls us jazz genre, which is rubbish. Uh, if you go to other sites, they call us funkadelic, funkadelic Afrobeat, whatever that means. So nobody knew where to place us. And if you listen to our music, even till today, you wouldn't know where to categorize. But how would you describe it? I would describe it as I would describe it as Afrobeat. Okay. You think so? Afrobeat. Was it rock? No, it wasn't rock. It was more Afrobeat because it was it had it had a beat to it. Right, and then those were the days of instrumentals. You got to have a lead. You got to have a lead guitar, making all sorts of noise and so on, because that's how music was in those days. Yeah, but who were those that were influencing you? You know, the there time? was no influence. We had no influence from anybody. People I've read in papers and so on that we were influenced by Blow and this and that and the other. Not so. Nobody. We never. We never listened to any other form of music. We didn't. We just came up with it by ourselves by accident. Okay, and really largely due to the talents of should I say, Meme the drummer. You know, these are 12, 13 year old boys and he was drumming very well, you know. And Paul Alade and the bass guitar, they were very creative uh, in the beat and we'd actually make things up as we go along, unknown to you. So when you decided to put all of the songs into uh, uh, a record, yeah. so to speak? Uh... Well, we didn't decide to put it into a record. It's actually, again, you know, parents would come and pick their kids up from school, from the concerts. It wasn't a concert, but the, the schools, the end of year, whatever they call it. And then they'd hear us play, you know, and then 
by word of mouth, it eventually gets to Odeon, Roger, EMI. And we're invited to the studios and we play and we get the thumbs up from him behind the glass. Yes, this is not bad, you guys are not bad. We need to um, tush you up a bit because it's a bit crude, you know, but we'll tush you up. So I want to get this lead guitarist for this session. We call it session men in those days. And that's how it actually happened. That's where the EMI thing came into it. And before we knew it, we were really big. I mean, Holy Child Girls, my sister went to Holy Child. Holy Child Girls would be at the gates of St. Gregory's College waiting to see us. Um, my house, my parents used to get so annoyed because people would be going there to see me. They didn't know I was in the boarding school, so they go to the house, they're all waiting at the gates to see me. So we had a lot of fame, no fortune, but we had a lot of fame. And we didn't know how to deal with it, just like the Jacksons. We didn't know how to deal with it because all of us were in the boarding school. All the figure boys were in the boarding school. So number one, you're not exposed. Secondly, you're in an insular environment with Catholic priests and mass and this, that, and none of us were Catholic. Reverend Father McGovern. McGovern, and oh yes, you know. And these are the guys that will beat the living daylights out of you, you know, <laughs> rest their soul. So, eventually you recorded. Yes. You're produced by... Um, EMI. EMI. Yes. All right. Any financial returns? Mm, yes and no. There were financial returns, but nothing, just like football, you know. I mean, when you look at the English footballers from the 60s, what they were getting paid, but compared to today's players, is nothing. What a player in those days was getting paid <clears throat> is the equivalent of what a player today gets in one minute, okay? So we were getting paid pretty well in those days, but it doesn't compare with what they get paid today. And don't forget, today... Well, you still get some royalties till date. No, no, no. No, no, no. I mean, the royalties are there, but we don't have access to them because we were, we were students. And don't forget, uh, music was never my calling. My calling was aviation. For me, the transition was 1969, when my dad took me to the USID in TBS, Tafabalewa Square in Lagos, when the Americans were, NASA was going to land a man on the moon. So we went there that evening to watch it. And when I saw it, I said, I'm going to become an astronaut. Okay? So I wanted to do nothing else in life than to become an astronaut. Nothing else. So all this music and so on was just okay, fun. So you eventually did what you wanted? No, uh, because I, I never I, became you an astronaut. You studied aer aeronautical engineering? Yeah, well, I studied aviation, yes. Aviation. Aeronautical yeah. science and so on. But, and computers, because uh, computers were my electives. You, you have to understand that back in 79, 80, there were no computers. Even when I came back to Nigeria in 82, it was like a foreign language when I said, we're going to computerize aero contractors. Everybody looked at me like I was a madman. I was actually sponsored as a pilot by Nigeria Airways. Um, and the flying school was in Zaria. I don't know what they call it today. Yeah. Uh, Nigerian Civil Aviation, I can't remember what it's called now. But anyway, uh, I was actually sponsored by Nigeria Airways in 1979. And, but, the, but, but the problem was that the, fl the school in Zaria was not... I knew because I knew I could do better than that. I knew I could be in a better environment than that because I didn't want to become just a pilot. I'm sorry I'm diminishing the profession, but I didn't want to be just a pilot. I wanted to be either the owner of the airline or manage the airline because being a pilot is transitory. It depends on your health. Were there things you saw while you were away studying that you think I was missing here in Nigeria? Yes, of course, of course. You know. It, it, for example, to become a pilot in those days, in Nigeria, it shouldn't take you more than 18 months. But it would take you four years or something. I don't know how long. I didn't do it. I didn't stay here long enough. But that's what happened in those days, when things started to fall apart. And I thought, well, look, if I'm going to waste four years of my life just learning how to fly an airplane, let me go and get a university degree, because they don't do that in this school in Zaria. Let me go and get a university degree in aviation so that I can learn how to manage an airline, to run an airline. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'll fly, but only for a short period. I just wanted to fly because I, I liked flying. You know, like when I was in St. Gregory's College, playing in a band was better than, because you were excused from going to class. Mm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So if I was a pilot, it's a hobby. I'd do it for free anyway. Even if you didn't pay me, I'd still be a pilot. But I wanted to run the airline or own the airline. That was my actual ambition. On the 19th of April, 2020, Paul Alade, a founding member of the Ufege Band, submitted to the virulent scourge of COVID-19 in faraway New Jersey, USA. This is how Dakwa Olumide reacted to the unfortunate news in a tribute. My dear friend Paul, the news of the last few days has shaken me to my core. It was unexpected. 
And what hurts me more is that because of this COVID-19 virus, I cannot pay my last respects to you. All I can do now is pay tribute to you from afar. A calm, reserved, gentle giant you wear. Pick a question. Takbo Olumide. What are the challenges facing the airline industry in Nigeria? It's all about corporate governance, or a lack thereof. You see, the only, the only way you can be successful in aviation, because aviation is highly regulated. In fact, the beauty of aviation is that it's very simple, because you don't have to invent anything. The regulations are there in black and white. Just apply them. Okay, that's number one. But again, I said I'm talking about corporate governance. The only way you can be successful is if you have proper corporate governance guidelines and policies, strict adherence to corporate governance. What do I mean by that? You have a remuneration board, you have finance and general purpose, you have the, all the subcommittees, you have a, a board that com is comprised of independent people who have not necessarily anything to do with the airline or anything to do with aviation. But you bring their ideas together and you have a consensus which is the way forward. But here in Nigeria, where we're hung up in the old in the 60s, where it's family-run businesses. Okay, now if I am married to your sister, for example, and we decide to set up a nuclear power station to provide electricity for Lagos, your sister, who is my wife, will be on the board. I will be the chairman. And then my wife will be on the board as well, and maybe my children. What do any of us know about nuclear power stations? Nothing. Why not get the professionals who do know about it to run it, and then we stay on the outside? Is that, is that a problem with the Nigeria Airways or the airline industry? Well, the only two airlines, there were, actually there were only, really, there were only two airlines that ever had corporate governance, proper, proper corporate governance in the strict term. That's Nigeria Airways and Virgin Nigeria. Okay, what happened to them is wasn't due to corporate. The failure wasn't due to corporate governance. The failure was ex other other reasons. Okay, but their corporate governance was what kept them in the uh, on the straight and narrow, because you didn't have leeway to do whatever you want to do. You've got to adhere to re regulations. So it's a corporate governance issue that pretty is, is paramount. Again, we have the wrong type of aircraft. You ask yourself, why is a Sky, the Ethiopian company, why are they doing so well? Why is the new Ghana airline doing so well? because they're operating small aircraft to Nigeria, between Lume and Lagos, it's a propeller aircraft. The Ghanaians are flying to Nigeria with a regional jet. You know, these are small things. But here in Nigeria, we have big 737s. And, you know, yes, the 737 is a good airplane, but not for short flights. Is it, is it, so is it a maintenance problem? Babe? It's not a maintenance problem. It's operating the wrong type of aircraft. Let's narrow down to what you call this. Is it code share agreement? Yes, code share. Huh, that's something. So that's something I brought to Nigeria, to aviation. When I was running Virgin Nigeria, I brought a code share, and it was very difficult, very, very difficult to what have a code share. About? Code share, what that means is um, a foreign airline coming into Nigeria. In those days, you could only go into Lagos or Abuja. We would then take their passengers from Lagos to Port Harcourt, Calabar, wherever. But they would call that flight. So when you have a ticket on Virgin Nigeria from Lagos to Port Harcourt, it would be Delta Airlines stroke VK, and there was a number to it. So it's a code share. So we're sharing the code between that foreign airline and this Nigerian airline. So what was the benefit of that? The benefit is that you're able to have a captive audience. You can bring in a larger market. So for example, you, if you want to fly to, for sake of argument, Washington, the only way you can go there is come from a, let's say you live in Port Harcourt, you fly from Port Harcourt to Lagos on whichever airline you like. Then from Lagos, you buy another ticket on, say, Delta Airlines to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta to Washington. But with a code share, you could buy your ticket in Port Harcourt all the way to Washington. But one section, one sector would be from Port Harcourt to Lagos on Virgin, Nigeria. The rest would be on Delta, but on one ticket, not separate tickets. And that is where it becomes very difficult for domestic. When I took over Virgin Nigeria, Virgin Nigeria at the time was having some problems. So I was invited to turn it around. The first thing I did was stop all those flights to London and South Africa. So we had no business doing that. And I, the reason I did that was because the cost, 
associated with it. And I thought, what we can do here is, because we had competition at the time, I don't want to mention the name of the airline that was competing with us going to London in those days. I said, There's a, I know we can do something. You know what? We can break their back. Let's stop flying to London and Johannesburg. That would make them excited and they add more flights and so on and so forth. But I knew that that would affect them negatively because Nigerians love traveling, but only economy, you're, you're, willing, you're only willing to pay the lowest fare possible. If I told you that there's a 2,000 naira ticket to London, I'm sure you'd buy it. But if I tell you that business class is 3 million naira, you say, ah, it's too much now, Abba. So we can fill the back of the airplane, the economy passengers, but that only pays for the fuel, okay? It doesn't make the airline profitable or anything like that because there are charges waiting for you and expenses waiting for you at the other end in London, for example. Navigation charges, landing fees, parking fees, catering, everything. So we, don't ha there's no, we have no business doing what we call the long haul. If the success story of uh, aero contractors is going to be written, do you think your name will find a place? I don't know. It depends how they want to write history. History has a way of being written to, as a convenience. Yeah. I was the first person black or white, who had been to university in aero contractors in 1982. Really? Yes. You didn't need a university education. Your father, my father, didn't, probably didn't go to university. Okay? But nowadays, my children need to have double masters, double PhD, and still be unemployable. Okay, so in those days, you didn't need a university education. And to be a pilot, you didn't need a university education. You just leave secondary school, go and learn how to fly. It's a mechanical skill, okay? And then you learn how to fly, and that's it. If you want to be an aircraft engineer, they'll teach you how to be an engineer, tools, fixing this, that, and the other. So that's straightforward. To manage the airline, you need to have management abilities, management skills. So you don't have to be a pilot to be a manager. Okay, actually pilots and engineers make bad managers traditionally. That's because they don't receive the formal training in management to do it, not because they're unable to. So when I came into aero contractors, I had a university degree in airline management. So, but you, you were in the aviation industry until you eventually uh, retired? I've retired twice. As a, retired twice? Okay, but you retired as a, the managing director. To rise up to that level, really, uh, w w what sort of challenges did you face in the industry before you, know, you got to that stage? Well, <laughs> the challenges were more internal than from the industry. Um, you know, the big challenge we have in Nigeria in business is that businesses are run by families rather than independent boards and I'm only used to and I grew up in an independent board scenario so when you have families running it it's not going to be successful and those were the challenges that I faced more so than the external because external challenges were there and were very significant and actually till today not much has really changed it's the same international airport that we commissioned in 1979. It's no different, it's not been expanded, nothing's different. So in 38 years, we're still treading water, as we say. We haven't moved forward from that point of view. If you were about to be cast away on an island mm -hmm. for the next couple of weeks, you know, what could be the five most important items you take along with you? My Bible. I take my medication with me. I would make sure that I had adequate clothing for protection from the elements. Okay, that's three. And four, I'd make sure I had with me lots of water because I'm not going to be able to purify the water. So I'd take lots of water with me. Okay. And then I'd have some equipment, basic equipment tools like um, a spade, fishing rods, um, matches, um, tarpaulin covers and so on to keep things dry. So you, you can get into a survival mode. So those are the five things I'd have. And that would keep me going. You notice I didn't say money. Well, we don't, you don't need money there because you can't spend it. <laughs> so you don't need money. You just got to have faith in yourself that you can actually overcome this challenge. Give us a parting song, maybe um, a song from one of your albums. There's also Try and Love. And, and oh, gosh, there's, there's many. There's Ophigi, there's Try and Love, there's Mimi Love. There's, yeah, there's, there's so many. I mean, there were, there were many albums, yeah. okay? And even after I left and I went abroad and they carried on, when they left St. Gregory's College. There are all sorts of songs. I mean, okay, um, which one would people know? I don't know. When Wizzy Labo smiles, you know that something's wrong. When he walks out and dances around, you better find your way. You know, so. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> now I'm going to make you sing next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank being you. on the program. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed yourself. This was a brilliant way to spend my day. Honestly, I've had, I've had a lot of fun. Thank you very much. That's <laughs> with Captain Dapo Olumide, former member of the Ofege Band and uh, retired as managing director of Virgin Nigeria. Yep. Thank you for being on the program again. Thank you. It was a pleasure being with a fellow musician too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. That's it on the program. See you next time. <laughs>